Good morning. Good morning. And happy Reformation Sunday. It is the Sunday that we remember the ways that some of our ancestors in faith demanded that their churches reform their ways to align with Christ's call. And as a result, new church traditions were created called the Protestant Church. The United Church of Christ, which we belong to, is a Protestant tradition descended from Puritans from England and German Reformed and Lutheran backgrounds. Today also, of course, is Halloween. It's a tradition that came over from the British Isles and that the United States has certainly um, uh, taken to new heights with uh, costumes and all sorts of things. So we are excited to be here for both Reformation Sunday and Halloween. There is much going on in the life of the church. First and foremost, the adult choir is up there. For the first time since the pandemic began, we are so excited to have the adult choir here. I kind of felt like a, a, a late night talk show host talking about the, the band. Um, that's not, it's, it's not that, but we are so excited because their ministry of, uh, of music is uh, so foundational for us as a community. Uh, and so we're grateful for them to, to be up there. And we invite you to join them if you feel so called in the weeks and the months to come. Also, our junior and youth choirs are resuming indoor rehearsals starting this Thursday, 6 to 6.30 p.m. for junior choir, which is for pre-K through second grade. And then 6.30 to 7.30 for our youth choir, which is third through sixth grades. And they're going to have pizza uh, to celebrate the resumption of those rehearsals. So if you like pizza, and if you're a kid, you know somebody who is a kid who likes pizza, uh, and who especially wants to, to sing or learn music, uh, then I suggest you uh, invite them to take part in that. I want to remind you that next Saturday, we turn our clocks back an hour before we go to sleep. Otherwise, you might show up here to worship an hour early, uh, if you do, then we'll just, uh, you know, conscript you to be an usher. Um, but otherwise, get that extra hour of sleep. Uh, then for November 7th, we have a lot going on. It's All Saints Sunday at our All Saints worship service. We share in the sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, and after which we recite the names of people who have died over the last year with bells rung to bless each of them into God's care. Tomorrow is the deadline for people to contact the church office if you'd like to add a name to our list. It is also Brown Bag Sunday, and in your bulletin insert uh, on the back side, there's a list of things that you can give for that. We don't have uh, brown bags. There seems to be a shortage of those, um, but you can bring those if you'd like to next Sunday or whenever. Any items for our food closet are much appreciated. It's also Bible Sunday next uh, Sunday. And so second graders will receive uh, Bibles from the church. So if you are a family with a second grader who hasn't already signed up for that, please contact our church office and we can make sure that your second grader gets a Bible. Um, our high school youth group, Senior PF, is having a freeze out Saturday, November 13th into Sunday, November 14th to raise awareness and funds for veterans in the region. You can sponsor a youth or an advisor Proceeds go to Homes for the Brave. You can also see the website. You can speak with Ashley um, or other folks she can point you to. I have a, um, a new Bible study um, series starting on Monday, November 8th at 6.30 p.m. It's both in the church library and hybrid. It'll be on Zoom. It's called The Bible from Scratch, the Old Testament for Beginners. And there are there are books that are needed for that. We have a few copies left here that you can get for a subsidized price or you can order it online. And that'll be six sessions on the Old Testament. And then in the winter, we'll be covering the New Testament. Um, I want to thank our liturgist this morning, Nina Kinzel, for participating as a worship leader. And our flowers up here are given in honor of Anne Sabo and all of her ministries of hospitality over the years as she transitions away from that ends up there. Uh, we're thankful for all the ways she's provided hospitality as we transition into a new stage. And if you would like to host a coffee hour in the weeks or months to come, just speak with us and we can line you up. But Anne has been the person who's been uh, just responsible for so much hospitality ministry. So we thank you, Anne. And it's, it's not as if she's, like, given up on leadership. She is the moderator of the church. 
Uh, so that keeps her busy. But now let us turn towards one another and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. If you're able, please rise for the call to worship. People of God, look around at creation and see the faces of those we know and love. Neighbors and friends, brothers and sisters, a communion of kindred hearts. People of God, look around and see the faces of those we hardly know. Strangers, People of God, look around and see all the images of God assembled here today. In me, in you, in each of us everywhere, God's spirit shines for us to see. People of God, let us worship God together. Vocation. Living God, we call on you to be with us now. Call on us to understand others, be patient towards those who do not understand, and loving to all people. May we celebrate Reformation Sunday as a reforming of truths lifted up over 500 years ago which are the building blocks, not of dissent, but of reconciliation and peace. May the ministry of our family of faith and of the universal family be enlivened by the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the image of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. and scoop out all of the gunk and the seeds and the schliff and then put a light within it. Gratitude is that interior light, right? It, it warms, it motivates us. And knowing that, I would say that gratitude is powerful, illuminating, transformative even. At one of the stewardship meetings recently, Nina, who is a member at large for the congregation and a friend to the stewardship ministry, mentioned this cool concept that she had seen called a gratitude pumpkin. Starting on Halloween, turn a pumpkin into a gratitude centerpiece for your home. And so each day from now until Thanksgiving, you would write something on it that you're grateful for. And you can start from the top or write it anywhere on the pumpkin. Now, I asked a few people before the service about things that they might be grateful for. And these are some things that we could add to our pumpkin. 21st birthdays. Happy birthday, Cameron. <laughs> Return of the choir to our worship space. We can be thankful and grateful for every day or for this beautiful weather, for babies in the nursery, for family and friends, for days off, for safe returns from vacation, for hospitality. Maybe you will experience a deeper sense of well-being in practicing gratitude on this odd canvas. Maybe you will see the accumulation of gratitude in that count your blessing sort of way. But come Thanksgiving, your prayer will already be written and ready to share. Thanks be to God. Feel free to send me pictures of your gratitude uh, pumpkin in progress until Thanksgiving. Amen. On this Reformation Sunday, we recall that Martin Luther spoke out against indulgences 500 years ago. Indulgences that were certificates people got from the church back saying that in exchange for giving money to the church, they would spend less time in purgatory. We invite you to give, not to shorten your term in purgatory, but because overflowing generosity grows in our hearts in love. We invite you to give time and money because the church is a place where generosity is multiplied through worship, outreach, faith formation, youth, and care ministries. We invite you to reform your hearts through generosity today.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. There is no way, O oh God, that we can repay you for what we have for you in Jesus Christ, or what you continue to do for us day by day. Our gifts are but the tokens of children to a parent to say, we love you, God. Amen. Please be seated. First of all, just wanted to mention singing uh, singing the, the first hymn of A Mighty Fortress Is Our God is a Reformation Sunday uh, tradition and uh, one reminding us of uh, the power of God. Uh, near the end of that second verse, there's this uh, phrase, Lord Sabaoth, and people might be like, well, what in the world does that mean? Uh, so just to kind of give you background in uh, the letter to the Romans, Paul makes a reference along those lines of Jesus being Lord Sabaoth, which is like the Lord of the heavenly host, so kind of like the Lord of the angels. So that's what that means. So, so next time you, you sing that, maybe before next Reformation Sunday, maybe not until then, you'll, you'll know what that is about. So this morning's scripture reading comes from the gospel according to Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. This is at the point in Jesus' ministry when he is entered triumphantly into Jerusalem the last few days of his life before uh, the crucifixion. And he's been spending a bit of his time in the Jerusalem temple, and he's been um, speaking, and also he's been uh, answering a lot of questions because there seem to be a lot of leaders of the Jewish tradition there in Jerusalem who want to ask him questions, some of which because they're curious about his answers, in some cases because they want to trap him to say something that will get him into trouble. And this seems to be one of those uh, cases. So just as a reminder, the Sadducees are a group of people who did not believe in resurrection. And so that's where their questioning comes from. So listen now for God's word. Some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first married, and when he died, left no children. And the second married her and died, leaving no children. And the third likewise, none of the seven left children. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Is not this the reason that you are wrong, that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is God not of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. May God have rich blessings to this reading of Holy Word. And will you pray with me? O oh God, haunt us with your good news. Amen. You've got your whole life to get ready to die. Right? You've got your whole life to get ready to die. Okay, so there are some complications to that statement, right? First of all, None of us knows when we're going to die. A woman says to a man, my grandfather knew the exact time of the exact day of the exact year he would die. The man responds, wow, what an evolved soul. How did that awareness come to him? The woman responds, oh, 
The judge told him. <laughs> In this case, the exception proves the rule. We tend not to know when we will die. Or there's the time that God tells a 50-year-old woman that she will live to be 100. The woman, grateful to not have to worry about her longevity, celebrates with cosmetic surgeries, liposuction, facelift, you name it. After recovering for a week in the hospital, she steps confidently outside and promptly gets hit by a bus and dies. Once in heaven, she runs up right to God and screams, You said I had another 50 years. You lied to me. God says, I didn't lie. I just didn't recognize you. <laughs> we do not know the shape of our lives as it unfolds. And even if we think we know, even if we think we have assurances, there's always room for some kind of twist to add uncertainty in there. There is no timeline for our lives and no timeline to prepare for our death. Now, another issue is that when given the chance, people tend to decide that we have no time to die or no time to think about dying or at least no time to talk about thinking about dying. Until recent years, there was this shift towards people dying in hospitals and hospices where medical professionals tend to work, and that makes sense. This, however, I think is why many folks hadn't fully absorbed the vast toll of human life that the pandemic took because people were dying from COVID out of the sight of most public eyes. The whole phenomena of funeral homes was a movement over 100 years ago of having post-death events away from one's own house because they used to take place in people's own homes, but then people decided that there could be these places called funeral homes that look like homes, just bigger and removed from one's own home, so they didn't have to associate those events with the place that they had to continue living in. Calling hours and funerals themselves have changed. Cremation has become more popular, which I totally understand. But it means, as a result, there are very few open casket calling hours or funerals where people have a visual confirmation of the person's death. I am often asked by people to make services more about the positive memories of a person's life and not about the fact that they have died. Well, once again, I get it. Death is upsetting. We want to honor the person for their living and not just for how they have died. But if we focus just on their life, there's less room for hope because we have had less room to accept their death. And just know that grief is a very patient and a very persistent emotion. And like death, will eventually catch up with all of us who are mourning inside. I also believe that the growth of Halloween as an American holiday attests to our reluctance to integrate death into our daily lives. It's part of that larger holidayization of things, where there's something that makes society uncomfortable, and so we give it a holiday so we can forget about it or neglect it for the other 364 days of the year, you know? Like, romance? That gets Valentine's Day. Parents? They get a Sunday in May or June. Veterans get November 11th. Family gets Thanksgiving. Racial justice just recently got June 19th. And now, or, and, and, and of course, death is consigned to Halloween. Of course, there's a buildup to Halloween with yard decorations that are put up throughout October. But in effect, it's because many of us try to squeeze all that is dark and deathly, all that is gross and grotesque into one night, because that's our cultural agreement. We acknowledge death in October. You can tell jokes about it in your Halloween sermon, Adam. <laughs> For the rest of the year, though, put away the freight gravestones, the ghosts and the spider webs, and put a sock in it about death. Last month, Kate Bowler published her book, No Cure for Being Human, that partly addresses the best life now movement. Bowler writes, quote, American culture has popular theories about how to build a perfect life. 
You can have it all if you just learn how to conquer your limits. There is infinity lurking somewhere at the bottom of your inbox or in the stack of self-help books. Some are written by spiritual guides promising to reveal God's single plan and purpose for my life. But there is truth somewhere inside of me. There is no formula. We live and are loved and we are gone. This is what happens. We fall ill. We get old. Our parents die before we know them. And our kids forget our love. We lose people before we can learn to live without them. Unquote. And Bowler's not just making this up. She's not just speculating, but she has her own life experience that a best life cannot be assumed or just willed. You see, Boulder has been living for the last six years with stage four colon cancer. She would be one who could say that life is far away from fair and far away from our control. But even Bowler is the first to admit, what do I know about dying? I've never done it before. People tend to avoid thinking about or preparing to die because it is so humbling to realize that we are all going to die, no matter what we do. The world, of course, likes to tell us to hide our vulnerabilities, hide our weaknesses, to pretend that we are the hero who never dies. In that world, growing old and dying will always be the supreme disappointment. The third complication about having your whole life to prepare to die is that we don't know for certain exactly what we die into. We can't really do research on it. There, of course, is the phenomena of near-death experiences and books that people write about that, but we could debate that all day long. Families ask me to help them explain death to children, and I usually share resources with them from Mr. Rogers or the picture book, Water Bugs and Dragonflies. But spoiler alert, among the water bugs, they all make this agreement that the next one who disappears will come back and tell them where they go to. And when that one water bug goes up the reed, and transforms from a water bug into a dragonfly, he can't get back into the water to explain it to the other water bugs because he just can't. And that's what life is like. My maternal grandfather was Lutheran, but also a follower of Emanuel Swedenborg. Swedenborg lived in Europe in the 18th century, he said that he had seen what life was like after this one. He described different planets that people were reincarnated, reincarnated into after death, depending on their earthly passions. Now, I never got to know my grandfather, but I do know that he loved to play tennis. So I imagine him on the tennis planet, hitting balls with Arthur Ashe. <laughs> but do I really believe that's where he is? How can we imagine or prepare for death if it remains the greatest single mystery of life? Today's scripture reading, which maybe you thought by now I had forgotten about, touches on this question, but not by giving a tiny answer, mind you. The Sadducees come to Jesus with a question Perhaps the Sadducees were so sad, you see. Uh, sorry, I couldn't help myself on that one. Um, <laughs> because they were the people in their Jewish society who absolutely did not believe in the resurrection of life after this one. If they had a motto, it might have been, what's dead is dead. So they asked Jesus a question to trap him. 
If there's one bride, they ask, who, due to a series of unfortunate events, marries seven brothers in succession after each previous one dies, then when she dies, who is she married to in this so-called life after this one? The Sadducees seem to think they have Jesus cornered. But to their surprise, he starts his response basically by wondering if they've never understood the Hebrew Bible or just have no faith in God's power, or most likely, both. Jesus says, after people rise from the dead, it's not just like some sequel to earthly life. It's not like people are married and share a house with a white picket fence. The closest thing Jesus describes it to is angels in heaven. And if you read Torah, Jesus continues, when God addresses Moses through the burning bush, God says, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. They may be gone from this earth, but Jesus says, God is God of the living, not of the dead. These people and others are somehow alive with God. In other words, Jesus warns the Sadducees and us not to assume that life after this will look exactly like it does here. And definitely, definitely, Jesus warns them, never underestimate what God can do. I have faith in God's power through Jesus Christ and through the story of Easter. But even with that faith, I cannot tell you what exactly comes after this life. That's why we call it faith and not certainty. But this is what I can tell you. I have witnessed many people in their lives and in their dying. And among those who seem best prepared for death, for what comes next, for people like Sue Palmer, or Jay Brothers, or Mike Lucas, or my grandmother Ruth. They were people who loved life, but were not, by my experience, ultimately afraid to die. They did not assume this life would go on forever. They were deep down humble people. They had become familiar with the experience that they cannot control life. Through their work or their ministry, they acknowledged death as a part of life. They were open to uncertainty, which strengthened their faith instead of weakening it. They did not underestimate what God could do, if not for their own personal health and life, then for the bigger picture. I might add that these were generous spirits who did not think of life and their resources or their skills as something that, that belonged to them and should just be held back for themselves. They were people who shared of themselves and of their resources with others. I think all of them looked to Jesus as teacher, as an example of dying with faith and dignity. I think they looked to Jesus as the pioneer of dying into that new life that God promises us. Jay and Sue, Mike and Ruth, and many others have been authentic in life and in dying. And I believe that those two things are connected. Dying, a faithful death, a death with integrity, I have seen go hand in hand with living a faithful and loving and even a happy life. The other good news, though, is that according to our scripture reading today, those people aren't just past tense, were people or beings. Today's reading says that they still are with God. We don't know if they have wings like dragonflies or angels. We don't know if they are ghosts who haunt us once a year or all the year round. We don't know if they are present in every blue jay that I see in my backyard, if they stay in heaven or on their designated planet. But I imagine that they are happy with God because they lived in love here, we're prepared to live in love there. God does not give us the most detailed description of life after this, doesn't tell us when we will die, does not let us be in total control of our lives, our best lives or otherwise. But God gives us Jesus, 
God gives us the witness of those who have gone before us. God gives us the hope that we can be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him in the next. So thanks be to God, and amen. And let us join our hearts in a spirit of prayer. Great reformer, we come to you knowing that you formed order from chaos, that you formed life and humanity from the earth, that you reformed your people from Abraham on to live in faith and righteousness together. You reformed your people through the presence of Christ to live in love and forgiveness and hope and justice. You reform us still today by the power of your Holy Spirit to start afresh, even after we have gotten into destructive ruts, ruts that devalue you, O God, ruts that devalue our neighbors and ruts that devalue ourselves. Refresh us. Reform us together in your divine image. We pray for our communities and our country as citizens prepare to vote and tally votes on Tuesday. We pray for the blessing of democracy spun from that theological commitment to honor the voices of all your people, one voice, one vote, one nation under you with liberty and justice for all, as you strive and we strive together for beloved community. Bless also our current leaders to move with mercy and a commitment to the common good. We give thanks for the beauty that surrounds us, for colorful leaves that inspire us, even as they enter their last phase of this iteration of life, even as they fall and disintegrate, nourish the earth and give new life. We thank you, God, for our voices. We especially give thanks for our music ministry and today for our adult choir. We pray, O oh God, for people who fear death. We pray for those who face their mortality or are facing illness and stress now. We pray for our Dean and Lara, Susan, Tom and Evelyn, Rita, Frank, Karen, Tiffany, Don, Nicole, Bev. O oh God, comfort your people who hurt. We pray also for those who have recently died and for their loved ones who mourn, as we name some now. We pray for the soul of Heather Beach, daughter of Mark Lindsay, and for Heather's family and friends. We pray for the soul of Lucas Baxter and his family and friends. O oh God, comfort your people who mourn. This afternoon and evening, God, guide your children who trick or treat, those who treat them with candy and other goodies. Bless our neighborhoods to be open and affirming of all, ghosts and vampires, devils and angels, storybook characters, and grotesque nightmares all. Bless us behind our masks. Bless us with our vulnerabilities. Bless us, O oh God, all sinners who strive to be saints and disciples. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
our help in ages past, our hope for life to come, our foundation in times uncertain and scary. May God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit guide our discipleship amid the tricks and the treats of this life and the supreme happiness promised to us in the next. Amen.